Hello to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. This is Andrei Shetnikov, and today I continue the discussion on screw-type wind turbines, and we will talk about the maximum efficiency of such installations in detail and thoroughly and comprehensively. It is indeed clear that something like maximum efficiency is established theoretically, not experimentally. And then theorists, experimenters, and engineers strive to build installations that are as close as possible in their efficiency to this maximum efficiency in order to achieve the desired results. Well, this is somewhat similar to the situation with the discovery of the maximum efficiency of a heat engine in Carnot's garden, although it is possible that the result concerning wind turbines is not as fundamental. And this result was obtained by several people. The first was Frederick Lanchester in 1915 and then independently Nikolai Zhukovsky in 1920, and Albert Betts also in 1920 reached the same result. In 1920, well, usually. This result is called Betts's Law, which is also known as the famous Betts's Law, and they all relied on a model that was earlier introduced by the well-known English physicist and scientist William Rankine. And Rankine was not dealing with wind turbines at all, but with ship propellers, precisely during the era when screw ships were replacing paddle steamers. And he developed the very first model that describes different propellers in the field of aerodynamics and various types of propellers and their characteristics. And this model is arranged in a very peculiar way. And I think it will indeed surprise you now. In Rankine's model, the propeller blades are not considered at all and the propeller is replaced by a disc of the same diameter. And it is considered that the fluid, or correspondingly, the air for a wind turbine, flows through this disc. It is clear that not everything can be obtained from this model, but important considerations regarding the power that needs to be applied to the ship propeller or that is extracted from the wind turbine blades are nevertheless very adequately derived in this model. Now we will see how this is done. And here is my first picture. It shows a transparent disc with an area of S, and a wind flow is passing through it at a speed of V. The question is, what mass flows through per unit of time? This is the product of density and volume per unit of time, i.e. area and speed. Knowing the mass, we can also determine the energy passing through this disc per unit of time, i.e. the power of the wind. K. Squared divided by 2, and we get RSV cubed divided by 2, i.e. The energy of the wind flow transferred per unit of time is indeed directly proportional to the cube of the speed of this flow. And in the second picture, the wind turbine started working and began extracting energy from the airflow, and the streamlines changed. Here the air flows quickly, but since energy is taken away, it flows slowly behind the wind turbine. Well, this means that the cross-sections corresponding to the area in front of the wind turbine for this tube should be smaller than the cross-section of the wind turbine itself and behind the wind turbine, on the contrary, larger. And at the same time, the law of conservation of mass, also known as the continuity equation, is fulfilled. So this Q, which is ROSV, must be the same in all sections. C1B1, C2B2 in all three sections. From 2 of B2 in all three sections. And one more point that needs to be noted here. The main thing is the idealization of this model. It is assumed that the flow was laminar before the disk, and it remains laminar after the disk. But we know that in reality, this is certainly not the case behind the disk. Behind the disk, the flow is turbulent. And this is the difference between reality and our ideal model that we are currently considering. Well, besides Q, Besides this mass flow rate, we can also write down the power that the airflow transfers to the propeller. This means the mass multiplied by the difference between the square of the speed before and the square of the speed after, and then divided in half again. So this is RSV, V1 squared divided by 2 minus V2 squared divided by 2, but I factored out the 2 here, right? And now the question arises, what is the value of this speed v with which the air flows directly through the disk in this model? 
Well, it is clear that it is less than the input speed and greater than the output speed. And now we will show that it is equal to the arithmetic mean of these two speeds. Now, we will express the power in another way, in a more elaborate fashion. Here we expressed it as the difference in kinetic energies. And now we will express it as the force with which the airflow presses on the disk, multiplied by the speed v at which it does so. Well, the force, according to Newton's second law, is the same mass per unit time RSV multiplied by the difference in speeds. So, we have the momentum before, the momentum after, and the difference in momentum. We get the following expression, RSV multiplied by V1, V2, and this speed, which I wrote here in blue, is added here. Well, in fact, V squared is formed here. And these two expressions need to be equated to each other. Well, you can do it on a piece of paper, but it's clear what will happen. The terms will cancel out on both sides. Here I will have the difference of squares. It will decompose as a difference, and the difference will also cancel out with the sum, leaving this v on top and v1 plus v2 divided by 2 on the bottom. Thus, we determine that the airspeed at the disk in this particular model is equal to the arithmetic mean of the airspeeds before and after the disk. Specifically, this model shows that the airspeed is the average. Next, I substitute this v1 plus v2 divided by 2 into the power formula, and I rewrite this formula in another way. I factor out v1 from all these multipliers, and I get r times s times v1 cubed divided by 2. What is this? This is the wind power that we introduced at the very beginning, the power of the wind impinging on the disk. And here remains this kind of multiplier. In it, I have denoted the ratio of speeds by epsilon. V1 is the initial speed. V2 is the final speed. Well, this bracket, 1 plus epsilon over 1 minus epsilon squared divided by 2. And this is the coefficient that shows what portion of the wind's energy we extract in this idealized model at a given ratio of speeds V1 to V2. Our calculations are indeed finally coming to an end. So far, I have been tormenting you with 7th grade level algebra, but it is clear that what matters here are the physical considerations, not the algebra. Well, now there will be a bit of mathematical analysis at the 10th grade level. Here is our function, which shows the dependence on the speed ratio from E. Conversion coefficient. Well, we need to find at what value of epsilon it reaches its maximum. So, we differentiate it, set the derivative to zero. This is a simple exercise. We get a quadratic equation. I won't write it out. Solve it and find that the derivative is zero when epsilon is equal to one third. That is, the output speed is approximately three times less than the input speed. Substituting this one third into our function f, we find that it takes the value of 16 27 For technical purposes, it is more natural to convert all this into decimal fractions. Approximately 0.59, therefore the maximum possible energy output is 59% of the wind flow energy through the cross section of our wind turbine. And this is Betz's law, as well as for everyone else who discovered this law. And let me draw all of this again on our diagram. So, here we have a wind turbine that sweeps an area S. Now, it is convenient for me to relabel the speed like this. The air approaches with a speed of v. I will now refer to it here. In the most efficient situation, the speed behind the wind turbine drops to one-third of this speed, and at the wind turbine itself, it is two-thirds. Well, we have already introduced the notation, the power of the wind flowing through the area, s rsv cubed divided by 2, and now we determine the maximum power that can be extracted from the wind by a wind turbine of this cross-section. It is 59% of the corresponding wind power. This is Betz's law. So, the maximum possible coefficient of energy extraction from the airflow is 0.59. But the joukowsky betz theory does not say anything about how to achieve this coefficient or even come close to it. It is too simplistic. To address this issue, 
it is necessary to consider the specific blade design. Well, we will talk about this in one of the next videos. Although, even now, we can hint at the direction this movement will take. In the Joukowsky Betts theory, it was assumed that the flow is laminar, both in front of and behind the rotor. But in reality, as we know, the flow behind the rotor is of course turbulent. And the task, therefore, is to reduce this turbulence as much as possible, in order to significantly... And what have the theorists, experimenters and engineers achieved in their collaborative work? Modern wind turbines have an energy extraction coefficient from the airflow of 0.5. This is 85% of the maximum possible coefficient of 0.59, a very, very solid achievement. And now I want to propose a problem for independent calculations. Part 1. Suppose we are dealing with a wind turbine with a blade length of 50 meters, and this wind turbine is encountering wind at a speed of 10 meters per second. The question is, what will be the power output of such a setup? And the second part, once you know the power, try to find out how many households similar to yours can be powered by this installation. Well, for that, you need to look at how many kilowatt hours you accumulate in a month, divide them by the number of hours in the month, and you will find out your average consumption in kilowatts. Then, you can compare it with what the wind turbine generates. Try to do this. This is an interesting exercise to, so to speak, evaluate what kind of installations work on wind energy. Do it! Write it in the comments to this video on YouTube. You can also ask questions and express your opinions there. And thank you very much for your attention.